All right. Hey, what's up? My name is Mateo. Welcome back. So, um, yeah, I was a little bit hung up by Monero going super hyper mega nuclear today. Obviously, had to get out a video on that first. But, um, you know, this video is for the super chatters, the tippers uh, who have asked me questions on xmarchat.com uh, slash Monero CPA. You can leave a question. You can leave a comment. Um, in the description below, there's the link. And, um, you know, I'll answer your question, leave a comment on the next video, whatever you want to do. I know that you all are a pretty smart bunch and very inquisitive, very unique. And um, any questions that you have that, you know, we could discuss, I think that would be fun for the channel. So um, thank you for all those who have tips so far. And let's go ahead and start with Jazz Coleman. Um, I don't know if that's your first and last name, Jazz, but uh, shout out to the OPSEC. Um, you say, great podcast. Do you think the introduction of a CBDC will be the main catalyst for large-scale Monero adoption? Well, I think the main catalyst, honestly, would be just people getting educated on Monero and realizing what it is. I think the main catalyst would be for people like Andrew Tate or Tucker Carlson or people who are like big in society commenting on Monero. And we've, we've seen little scintillations of that um, in regards to somebody mentioning Monero to Tucker um, we've seen so many big names out there commenting on Bitcoin's privacy flaws and how bad that is. We saw that with Russell Brand. Uh, we've seen that with Tuck Carlson. Uh, we've seen that uh, with Nivelle and others. And um, all it takes is for them to get tuned into Monero and to realize the value of having private fungible cash. I think that would actually be the main catalyst um, because we have so many bullet points together that show the use case and value of this and the ecosystem has grown such that if people get wind of this and if people like start to tune in and understand the value here then they would ape into it we don't have to wait for a cbdc monero is incredibly value right now valuable right now but if you have a cbdc come through um then yeah that's going to add certainly some value because um i actually brought up this tab here and i don't know if you guys remember from a couple years ago and we checked this out very consistently this used to be like a coloring book that you would color in it used to be just totally blank and you had some stuff like in uh you know research over here in some countries and then over here you had maybe one or two countries uh in the pilot stage i think there was like maybe one that had launched I guess the Bahamas has a CBDC, Jamaica has a CBDC, totally random. <laughs> Why are those countries have CBDCs? I mean, you can't imagine. You go to Jamaica, it's just like everyone's sitting around drinking coconut milk, surfing on the beach, and then like you're also part of like a technocratic panopticon. It's like, what's going on there? But um, this is crazy because you have 44 countries in pilot phase. And I don't know if you all remember, at least this is my memory, but we only had a few of those in the pilot phase a couple of years ago. It was really just China and I think one other country. But now we have 44 countries. Most of Europe is in the pilot phase. We have Russia in the pilot phase, India in the pilot phase, Saudi Arabia, Brazil, South Africa, the BRICS countries in particular. Um, so there's really a lot of development going on. And by the way, this is the Atlantic Council. And these people are you know, part of the globalista world economic form type of cadre. And, um, you know, you also have a lot of development going on in Canada, the United States and Mexico, the NAFTA countries, they are developing the CBDC. There's so much momentum going on here that it's hard to imagine that at some point we just kind of like say, never mind the CBDC. It looks like this is something which is coming. And um, I know one thing that I discussed with a lot of people at Monerotopia was the fact that the stable coins, we're going to be sort of like a cryptic CBDC that uh, sneaks its way into society without technically being called a CBDC, even though it is programmable, even though they can freeze your account and things like that. So um, we'll see kind of where that goes. But um, would it be a large catalyst for Monero use? Yeah, I think so. And you know what? It's interesting seeing Bitcoin bros respond to how the CBDCs are developing by saying Bitcoin is the solution to this. But what you see, which is fascinating, which we actually predicted, not trying to be prideful, but just saying like France, Denmark, and the United States was going to be one of these countries. They are proposing unrealized capital gains taxes on crypto. Um, now, if they do this, 
then the argument that you can get away from the inflation tax with Bitcoin and crypto is going to be, you know, a kind of tough sell because if the value of your crypto is going up, um, you know, nominally, but not in real terms, but they tax the nominal gain, then in real terms, your value is being conscripted from you. And you're not escaping inflation at that point because you're being taxed on the inflation adjusted gain in your assets. And, um, you know, this is something that people said that we could get away from by not being in the CBDC because on top of inflation, there is speculation that they're going to maybe institute a program where if you didn't spend your CBDC uh, in a quick enough manner so as to stimulate the economy, then they would charge you some kind of penalty or some kind of tax. And so, um, you can't really get away from that if you're a citizen in one of these countries where they are taxing the unrealized gains of your crypto. And by the way, that's really nuclear for Bitcoin in a bad way because they've sold this as a store of value. And if people have to consistently sell their Bitcoin in order to get the liquidity to pay these taxes, um, then that's going to put um, you know consistent selling pressure on the price. And there's so much leverage right now uh, with Bitcoin right now that that could cause a cascading effect and that could be really damaging. So um, again, I think Monero is just so useful and awesome because it focused on the right things first. It focused on becoming a medium exchange before a store of value. It's private and there's opt-in transparency coming with full chain membership proofs where you can see Monero going into a wallet and Monero coming out of a wallet if you opt to you know, release your view key. Um, so that is the best way to approach the CBDC. I think more people are going to figure that out. And if the price of Monero continues to go up, then I think that's going to attract a lot of attention to it. And as we know from human behavior, people seem to justify price appreciation after the fact they try to figure out what has utility with something that is gaining in price so that they can justify the price increase and then get in themselves. Um, so that's how I would respond to that. And we have other, you know, things in our super hyper mega bullish case that make Monero pretty obvious because, you know, if, if they do unrealized capital gains tax on crypto, you know what people are going to do. And I'm I'm not advocating for people to evade taxes with Monero. I'm a CPA. I can never do that. You know what I mean? But I'm just saying what people are going to do. Like, it's pretty no brainer, right? It's not that, it's not that hard to kind of piece together. Um, and you know, I could go on forever about the, you know, Monero macro thesis. We'll get into that, you know, more in depth another time. But thank you for the question, Jazz. And then a fan, uh, you sent 0.01 Monero. I appreciate it. Uh, you say, hey, dude, big fan. Glad you're back posting again. Do keep it up, but no pressure. Had a question. How do you square the circle of anarchism Monero versus pay your taxes? I don't submit tax returns. I'm an anarchist, but my girlfriend, who thinks you're cool, is on my case. Okay. Um, first off, I want to say um, I was an anarchist, libertarian, anarcho-capitalist in my early 20s. Um, I am no longer because I'm an Orthodox Christian. Orthodox Christianity is incompatible with anarchism. Um, I know that some people in our space try to you know, view Christianity and anarchism as compatible. I don't think you can actually make that case. But um, I, because I was an anarchist, I'll try to answer this from your perspective, and I'll try to actually answer it from you know uh, somebody who was going in to become a CPA or a tax accountant as somebody who was a libertarian. So you know when I went into tax accounting, it wasn't to necessarily facilitate the payment of taxes to the government. I know some people have that misperception about tax accountants, but really what we do is minimize taxes for people. And I've probably saved people millions of dollars on taxes throughout my rather short career so far as being a tax accountant. By the time I'm 40 or 50, assuming we still have income taxes, um, you know, that number could be in the tens of millions, hundreds of millions. I mean, that would be ideal, right? That'd be great that I could save that many people on taxes. So our job is to help people who are part of the system. They have rental properties. They have uh, businesses with EINs and all that kind of stuff. Uh, be compliant, of course, because you don't want the IRS to come after you. And I'll get to that here in a minute with you. Um, but also just to minimize their tax liability um, with whatever legal you know, ways that we can do that. 
And so, um, you know, I actually think that being a tax accountant is one of the more libertarian jobs that you could have because you're helping save people on what is the biggest expense they're going to pay in their lives, especially if they're living in the United States, and also um, giving less money to the government, which uh, obviously is going to use it for some nefarious purpose, or at least you could probably presume that to be the case. Um, So in regards to your situation being just a taxpayer, I would assume that you're a taxpayer. Um, maybe not right now. But, uh, well, actually, you are. And let me actually just say this at the outset. You pay so many taxes um, that I don't even think you're aware of um, uh, that you honestly just can't avoid if you're living here in the United States. The income tax is just one more tax on top of that. So if you go to a hotel in another state, you're going to be paying an occupancy tax, a hotel tax. They have those. Um, if you uh, fuel up your car, you're paying a fuel tax. If you are using telecommunications networks, you're probably paying some tax in regards to that. You're paying sales tax. I mean, we could go all the way down the list. Property tax. There's so many taxes that you pay already. What is it to pay an extra tax, your income tax? Now, um, one thing that's interesting about your case um, is the fact that from what I can glean from your question, the IRS has not come after you yet. And if the IRS doesn't come after you, it could be that you actually don't owe any tax at all because um, you didn't make enough to file a tax turn. Now, I'm not assuming that you're a brokey or anything like that, but if you make, um, I, I forget what the standard deduction is in 2024, but if it's less than, I think, $14,000, then uh, your standard deduction is going to take care of your income tax liability. And you know, it could be that if you're a W-2 and you paid withholding into the system throughout the year on top of the standard deduction, um, it could be that they determine that the withholding and the standard deduction make it so that whatever tax liability they think you have is already covered. And should you file a return, it could be that you are actually owed a refund. And they're obviously not going to send you a notice and say, hey, you know what, if you file a tax return, we'll actually give you money. They're not going to say that. They want to keep the money themselves, and in fact, if you don't file a tax return, um, you know, within three years of you know the original due date, then you could actually lose uh, whatever refund that you would have been um, uh, rightfully given. So that's something to consider. And one thing that you can do to kind of see what your situation is with the IRS, you could set up an ID.me account with the IRS. And um, I'm not going to go through that process here. You'll, you can figure it out. It's actually pretty easy. But you set up your ID.me account and you can view your transcripts and you can see what information the IRS has received um, in regard to you because they get your W-2s, they get your 1099s, they get all your tax forms. And um, you know if they determine that you don't owe any liability, they're not going to send you any kind of notice. Um, but you know, you want to you want to get into compliance if you're not in compliance, because if you're not up to date on your tax compliance, then, um, you know, God forbid, they could take away your right to travel out the country. They could take your passport. That is a thing where if you have back taxes and you're not paying your taxes or getting caught up on your tax obligations, they could, you know, take your right to leave the country. Um, if they have been sending you notices, but you're just kind of unaware, they could start to garnish your wages. Um, and there are, there's kind of a big process, um, you know, from them deeming that you owe them money to them taking you to jail. It's a very long process. People tend to kind of overstate it and, uh, they think that, well, if you get your taxes wrong, then you're just going to go to jail. Now, unfortunately, and let me just say, this is why the Roger, this is why the Roger Ver case is so ridiculous because, what they should have done when he owed his exit tax is they should have checked it when he left the country because you pay your taxes before you get the stamp of approval to leave the country. They should have at that point said, hey, there's a problem. Um, and later, if they determined that there was a problem, they should have given him the opportunity to pay the tax that he, they felt that he owed. Or they should have given the opportunity for him to dispute the charge. Rather than just say, hey, you're under arrest in a foreign country after not being a citizen for 10 years. It's the most ridiculous case ever. And if you listen to people like Robert Barnes, who has worked on tax cases for decades, he'll say the same thing. It's the most ridiculous case 
And if you also think it's ridiculous and you love Roger Ver, I do have the link below for the petitions that you can sign to free Roger. Um, it really is just a total travesty of justice what's happening to him. But there is typically a long process, um, you know, uh, for them to go through until they actually start to take your property and take you to jail even. So I do want to say that. Um, so there's the practical perspective of just paying your taxes, getting up to compliance, just so that you can have it take care of. You don't have problems with the IRS, which does cause stress in your life that's undue. Um, and you, you don't want to go to jail for uh, not paying your taxes because you can't really do much good in jail versus being out of jail. I mean, just ask Erwin Schiff, right? Peter Schiff's dad. I actually have this book. Um, that's how you know I'm like the greatest CPA ever is I have a book in my library in my office called The Great Income Tax Hoax. Hello? <laughs> Great book. Um, but Peter Schiff's dad, he died in prison because he was telling people not to pay his taxes and he was not in compliance with his taxes. And, um, you know, that's not a good position to be in. There are many ways that you can um, fight the system as opposed to messing with their money, you know, and, and not paying your taxes. You can just get into private crypto. You're doing the exact right thing, building the parallel economy. You can't build the parallel economy in jail. I mean, I guess you can in a way, but you don't have phones. You don't have the capacity to trade Monero in jail, I don't think. But, um, you know, there are ways to build infrastructure outside of the system uh, that is stable and, uh, you know, that can build a foundation for, you know, doing good as opposed to just doing a full frontal assault against the IRS. That just never works. Um, and also one thing about kind of getting older that I've noticed is that um, idealism doesn't really go too far. Um there is a place for it, and it's good that young people typically are ideal so that they can challenge entrenched ideas and offer alternative perspectives. Um, but ultimately, the way that change is made in the world is through money and power, um, and, and force actually wins most of the time um, and influence and things like that. That is something that you realize as you mature. Um, of course, if God is on your side and you have prayer and... Um, you know, you are on the right side of things. That definitely helps. Um, but, you know, it is, uh, um, well, I won't go into that. But, um, yeah, you want to be able to play smart, okay? You want to be able to be in compliance, but also build up your uh, wealth, build up your uh, life, so that you could be of influence in the world, so that if you think income tax is a bad idea, you could end up like Donald Trump and Elon Musk in the White House saying, hey, maybe we should get rid of the income tax, right? That's, that's a much more effective strategy. Um, now, I'm not saying you should get involved in politics. I, I'm pretty out of politics at this point. Um, I think it's pretty much all totally rigged. But um, hey, if they get rid of income tax, that's a fantastic thing. And Donald Trump, Elon Musk, all these people have paid their taxes all their lives. They've done what they can to comply. They didn't just straight up say, hey, we're not going to pay your taxes. Instead, they got into Congress. They got themselves tax credits. They got themselves certain deductions that they're able to take advantage of, both Elon Musk and Donald Trump, with, of course, the depreciation benefits that you get in real estate, the 1031 exchanges, the um, – uh, cost segregation strategies and everything like that that's in real estate that basically makes it that you never pay tax. And for Elon Musk, where you get energy credits for alternative energy, um, both of them were able to use their power and influence in order to influence the tax system so that they could effectively not pay any tax. And that's the more intelligent way to go about it. Um, so I, I would suggest a different strategy from just not paying your taxes. Um, now. Are you saying that, okay, well, the government is evil. I don't, I don't want my money going to the government because I think they're going to do evil things. Well, you as a libertarian, fundamentally, you are a materialist um, uh, utilitarian. That is kind of like the ethical basis of libertarian philosophy. And I understand that you know you have praxeology and you have the against me argument and therefore you have the non-aggression principle and all that kind of stuff. Um, but ultimately, all this stuff comes down to utilitarian ethos um, because there aren't any transcendental kind of ideals here. 
um, you know, where you have an objective standard for good and evil. You don't have, uh, you know, telos, um, you know, because there isn't that transcendent spiritual factor in regards to libertarianism as much as people try to join those things. But libertarianism itself is fundamentally about, uh, you know, what you can do in order to optimize your own happiness and your own well-being. And that is strictly in the material sense. And um, if you are under coercion, then you are going to do whatever you can in order to optimize your freedom. And that is, I think, praxeological in the libertarian philosophy. It's not so much in the Orthodox Christian philosophy, because in the Orthodox Christian philosophy, um, we have freedom in faith. Like, we don't really actually bother with uh, whether or not the government gives us freedom or whether or not this person or that person gives us freedom or whether or not we have financial freedom or any of these things. At least we're not supposed to. We're supposed to have freedom in Christ. And that meant to say if somebody is threatening us with death, uh, you know, it's either like, hey, you renounce Jesus or you die. Obviously, if we have freedom in faith, then we're going to affirm our belief in Jesus Christ and they can go ahead and they can put us in the ground if they want to. Um, you know, because ultimately we have a different definition of freedom than a materialist. And, um, you know, if you are somebody who is a materialist, which libertarians by their own philosophy are, and I understand that there are a lot of spiritual libertarians and anarchists, I've met a lot of them, but fundamentally, if you are an anarchist or a libertarian, which comes out of an enlightenment materialist 17th century, 16th or uh, 18th century philosophy, then, um, you know, your goal is to optimize your well-being here, and that means to, um, uh, you know, maximize your freedom by doing whatever you can to do so. And if you are in a coercive situation, um, then you ultimately do not have free will in accordance with your philosophy. And therefore, uh, it's not about necessarily principle. It's more or less, again, about utilitarian ethic. What is going to be the most preferable thing to do? in this situation, given that I'm under coercion. So in this case, it makes sense to pay your taxes and, um, you know, just live to fight another day. Let's see, anything else that I can think about? Um, I know I'm kind of giving you like a real in-depth answer here, but it's actually not a simple question. So I'm glad that you asked this because um, one thing that I do respect about libertarians is that they want to be logically consistent. And if you want to be logically consistent and you want to be consistent in your actions, then, um, you know, paying taxes is going to be a challenge if you see the tax system as being fundamentally immoral and you're trying to do things right. But, um, you know, morality for an individual in the libertarian context goes out the window um, when coercion and force is involved. Because then you don't have free will. And that is the argument that I remember Stefan Molyneux making very long ago when I had the same kind of question. And uh, that's the answer that I think that I would give to you. It's, it's not so much a moral situation if there's coercion and force involved. You kind of have to just go along to get along. Um, again, the perspective in Orthodox Christianity is a little bit different, but we Orthodox Christians are not libertarians, so this isn't really a problem that we, we struggle with. You know, give unto Caesar what is Caesar's. You know, that's kind of our perspective, give unto God what is God. Um, so that's what I would say about that. I didn't expect this video to be so long, but hey, I love my bros who leave the chats and the tips. Um, let me know if that answers your question. I also appreciate the fact that, um, you know, you didn't simp out for your girlfriend. You didn't say, oh, baby, you want me to pay my taxes? Okay, I'll pay my taxes. You came to ya boy to ask the question and have me give you the check so that you can... Uh, you know, safe face, right? <laughs> but um, yeah, bro, um, pay your tax. Just get it done, honestly. Um, and get caught up on that stuff, man. Because honestly, just you don't want to mess with the government full frontal assault like that. You know, there are more intelligent ways to go about this. Um, and um, yeah, also check out your Orthodox Church, if I could throw that out there. Because um, like I said, anarchism and Orthodox Christianity um, you can only be one or the other. And I would assume if you're an anarchist, you're not an anarcho, or excuse me, you're not an Orthodox Christian. Of course, I would definitely recommend that you 
um, convert to Orthodox Christianity, but investigate it first and go to a local church, talk to your local priest, read some books, re- listen to Jay Dyer and people like that. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I will, of course, pray for your conversion, brother. But um, that's all I've got for you. I'm not going to ramble anymore. My name is Teo. If you want to leave a tip, go ahead and, uh, you know, send one to Monero's CPA in the description below and um, sign the petition for Roger Ver below as well. Uh, if you want to leave a donation for Zano, I have my addresses below for that. I'm going to have more Zano vids coming. Uh, I was just to announce the community member of the month for Zano, which is really cool. Shout out to all the cool Zano bros. Love you long time. And let's check on the price of Monero. Is it going hypernuclear still? Is that 200 bucks? Cool. Awesome. All right. Well, I'll see you next time. God bless. Bye.